You're listening to the Career Jump Podcast. Insights, interviews, and success stories to inspire and give you the edge when you make your next career jump. Hosted by your career concierge, Andrew McCaskill. Hello, welcome back to the Executive Career Jump Podcast. I'm your host and career concierge, Andrew McCaskill. And I'm delighted today to be joined by Fiona Hathorne. How are you, Fiona? I'm very well and very much looking forward to talking to you. Thank you very much for taking the time. So Fiona is currently the CEO of Women on Boards, which is a very interesting organisation. Just for the listeners that might not have come across your organisation before, can you tell us a bit more about it, please? Sure. Uh, We're an organisation that transparently advertises board vacancies for free. And then we support anybody, uh, men as well as women. I realise our brand name might put men off, but we can talk about that later. Um, Sell themselves into the boardroom because what boards do is not rocket science. And many people feel that if they haven't had exposure to the boardroom, they need a certificate to get onto boards. And actually there's a board out there for everyone, no matter what age you are. So we just empower people by helping them write board CVs, showing them board vacancies and explaining them how to sell their board a value add. Because if you want a board position, there's nobody, no point going to an interview talking like an executive. You are not there to run the company. You're there to oversee the company or the charity or the governing board, whatever it is. So how you sell yourself in your interview and how you put yourself across on a piece of paper to get your interview is really what we're all about. Love it. And love that demystification element as well. Just for further context then, Fiona, if you're happy, love to hear a bit more about your personal background before we get more into the Women on Boards discussion. Sure. I did a business degree. And my first job was at PwC. I decided I desperately needed a professional qualification. And so I looked to train as a chartered accountant. I didn't actually end up training and completing my accountancy qualification because the reason I was doing it is I knew I wanted to work in the city. I didn't come from a family with a city background, but I was fascinated by stocks and shares. I remember going to the library at college, seeing some of the lads on our course, looking at stock prices and not really knowing very much about it and sitting down having a chat about the city. And I was very interested in becoming a fund manager, somebody who buys and sells shares. And as luck would have it, and luck plays a part in life, I happened to be at a party a year into my accountancy training and I met a city head hunter now he didn't headhunt for graduates but he was just talking to me about the city and he mentioned that Hill Samuel were looking for some trainee fund managers and I rang him up the next day he couldn't even remember talking to me um, but he certainly couldn't dispute anything I said and I said would you put me in touch with Hill Samuel Asset Management and to see if I can become one of their graduate trainees anyway he did Uh, And I got the job and that's how I moved into the city. And I spent uh, the most fabulous 15 years in the city as a fund manager. And I specialised in emerging markets, so Far Eastern equities. Um, I moved into global equities later. I then had a brief foray uh, working uh, with my husband in his asset management company. Be careful what you wish for. That was interesting. And then I had a bit of a career break when I did a bit of angel investing before I launched Women on Boards in 2000 and 12. What was it about Women on Boards that made you want to launch it here in the UK? Well, um, I didn't. I mean, again, luck plays a part in life. Uh, I was sitting at a an evening networking event with Mercers. I remember that. And it was uh, very near the Tower Bridge. And I was listening to Lord Davis, who was tasked by the UK government to look at the lack of women on boards. I have to admit, I didn't really particularly know there was an issue, even though I was a fund manager buying and selling shares. And I heard a lady called Claire Braund, who was one of the founders of Women on Boards in Australia, talking about the need to support people, hold their hands and demystify the boardroom and crucially advertise board positions because most boards don't advertise. They talk about wanting diversity of thought. They talk about different people but they're petrified of people they don't know which is why she talked about you can fix the FTSE 100 the FTSE 350 are biggest listed companies Uh, you and I actually Andrew could do that ourselves you can micromanage a few boards but actually if you really want to make a difference in our society you have to tackle the thousands hundreds of thousands of board positions and get people exposure to the board from a young age anyway I listened to her and thought that's a fantastic idea great idea must meet this woman what a great person and uh, we had a lovely dinner I introduced her to a few people she was visiting from Australia and she said right which one of you three 
is going to get off your backside and do it in the UK. And we're, oh, no, 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 we're not going to do it. We're just talking to you about what a great thing. She said, no, 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 somebody's actually got to do something. And I said, no, no, I, I don't want to, to run a what looks like a women's network. I don't really know. And she said, well, you just wasted three hours of my time then. So being very direct and on it, and within the next couple of hours, a few more glasses of wine, she persuaded me to do it. And I did it. And at the time, I was doing something called angel investing. So seed capitaling, uh, putting your own capital in seeding a few companies. And if I'm honest, because I'd had a pretty stellar career in a very male dominated environment, I had no concept of the glass ceiling or the issues that some women might have or some men, actually, if they're a minority in a group. And we were probably won't cover this. You'd have to know about my father and my personal background to know what made me slightly different. And it wasn't until I became an angel investor, I saw how difficult it was for female entrepreneurs to get capital from a very, very male-dominated industry. And it was a light bulb moment. I bet it was, yeah. When it comes to the footsies, if you talk to the majority of HRDs, their preferred and primary channel of recruitment is still referrals. Mm -hmm. And the trouble with that is it tends to result in some of that nepotism because if you're directly incentivizing people like you to refer more people like them, you don't tend to end up with diversity very quickly. So this, I think the whole way that diversity is incentivized within organizations needs a bit of a, a rethink. And referrals is, the, the over-reliance on internal referrals, I think, is, is still a major challenge, personally. You mentioned, which I thought was a really nice point, this idea of there being the right board for everybody and boards being accessible to people. Uh, it's well documented in the research, particularly um, when it comes to women, that women tend to qualify themselves out rather than qualifying themselves in too much. And they need to, hit, they need to feel like they hit 90% of the brief whereas men tend to need to feel like they hit 60% of the brief. Why is that? What can we do about that? What have been your experiences in, in helping people, I guess, break through that barrier? Well, I mean, when we're talking about the boardroom, um, you're talking about university club boards, so or a college board. It could be, you know, the snow skiing rock club. It could be the rugby club. It could be the debating society. And each of those clubs, even if it's a local football club or a little tiny charity in your community they're usually raising some capital it could be in terms of membership fees donations uh, and they're raising capital to do something so in the case of the hockey club at university or the local hockey club down the road it's to pay for the fixture to pay for the match and there's usually a committee that sits on the top of that now a lot of people don't think that's a board but it is many of these organizations are set up they have a tiny little constitution they may or may not be a charity, but if anything goes wrong, somebody will be pointing at the people who had that little, you know, cash pot and didn't do the right thing. So to me, that when I said there's a board position out there for everyone, and the minute you are responsible for, I don't know, the, the hockey club accounts or the rugby club accounts that probably report to the student union or whatever, um, it really feels different. And you've got a duty to do the right thing. So for me, it's demystifying that. Those people who have a knowledge and sense of the boardroom, they've usually had exposure to the boardroom from a young age. Um, so uh, whether it's within their company. Now, in my case, my father was on quite a lot of local boards. So he was on the police authority board. He was on charity boards. Um, he was a local councillor. So I had a sense of the boardroom because my mother worked full time. So my father would often take me to the board meeting. So from the age of four, six, eight, I'd be colouring in the corner. So I have a sense of what goes on in the boardroom. Um, and I had a sense of responsibilities and liabilities without even knowing that I did and how boards were run efficiently. So for me, um, it is planting those board seeds, even for people who are at school, because you might meet your niece, your nephew, a neighbour, um, talk to them about the boardroom. The majority who are connected to those people on the board, they hear about it at the pub, they might hear about it at the football club, the rugby club, they know people on boards and somebody might say, oh, I was, on an, um, I was at um, an NHS, you know, governor's meeting the other day, oh really, uh, they're sort of branding themselves, they're showing off and if you're not connected and exposed to those people, you don't know. 
So for me, it's planting seeds, whether it's with um, children at school, we've got one corporate member of women on board. We run a workshop um, called um, Get On Board for people in their sixth form. And we're saying to them, what does your headmaster do? Who's calling the headmaster the cat? It's called the governors. Who is your governing board? What do they do? And then telling them about all these boards out there. So for me, uh, that's how we instigate change. And, and you're absolutely right. The research is very, very clear that uh, minorities, and I say minorities rather than women or men, because it's not about women. Minorities often feel they need to be competent an expert in something before they're confident enough to apply and take their stretch job. If you look like the incumbent majority, you don't need to be as confident because you can visualize yourself and your likelihood is you have more connections to those people and they're going to be encouraging you and supporting you. So that's what we've got to do to say, actually, there is support out there for you. You know, you can be a member of my gang, whether you're male or women on boards gang, and we will support you. And one of the things that we do that's unique, because there's lots of people that say it will help you in the boardroom, is we hold your hand at the point of interview. And we love taking those calls. So if you were going for an interview, Andrew, I'd say, Andrew, what are you worried about that? What are you worried about in your interview? And you would tell us, and you say, oh, don't worry about that. So it might be, well, I'm not an expert in university governance and I'm about to go for an interview to be a governor of a university. And we'd say, well, that's great, Andrew, because they don't actually want your university expertise. What they're looking for is your digital change knowledge because they're going through a period of digital change. I've got all those other experts and you are a cog that fits in. So why don't you sit back and interview them? It's a difference. So it's giving that support, that support that, that I would say the majority who look like the incumbent people sitting on boards already have by default because of their networks and connections. Yeah, that's very interesting about being able to visualise yourself in the room because you identify easily with who's already there. Never thought of it in that way. Great, great advice. In terms uh, prior to the interview, uh, how can people present themselves from a personal branding perspective, from a CV or online perspective in a way that's attractive to boards? Well, the, the, we, we run a workshop called Get On Board, which is about the basics of what does a board do? It's not a big, heavy corporate governance course because what boards do is very simple, and I'll tell you that in a minute, um, and also help people write a board CV. So that's crucial. And if you join a board, you need to know what a board does. And actually... What a board does is incredibly simple. It only does two things, by and large. Performance, which is strategy and stargazing and holding the executive to account. So looking at their budget, looking at the risks they're taking, working out, you know, signing off an investment plan outside, you know, the, the remit of the chief exec's signatory, whatever. So that's performance. The other thing is conformance. And that basically is filing your accounts. It's all the legal stuff. It could be health and safety. It could be employment law. It could be the Bribery Act. Things that you know about, mostly because you've worked in a big company and you've heard about, but your job is to make sure the board is doing the right things with regard to conformance, filing by the law, filing your accounts, and performance stargazing. And, and the minute you know that, you, I say to you, which are you? Are you going to be more of a conformance person? So for example, if you're a lawyer or an accountant, or are you going to be more of an investment strategy? Are you more strategy? Are you more change? Are you on the digital side? What are you? Which are you? Because when you go into the boardroom, they've usually got, they should have a skills audit of the board and they should be looking for a particular type of person to fit a particular seat. So how are you going to sell yourself into that role? Then on top of that, you've got what does a non-executive director really do? And that is uh, bringing a moral compass to issues. It's actually noses in and fingers out. You're not there to run a company. So when you get to the interview, it's actually almost a personality interview. Do you get the difference between an executive and a non-executive director? And one of the things that I've also got to do in these Get On Board workshops, we have guest non-exec presenters, is to make sure you do understand your duties your responsibilities and your liabilities, because sadly, you don't get paid for being on most boards. Most charities don't pay. They can't legally. University boards don't pay. Uh, there's government boards, the sports boards. They often don't pay. 
very few of the sort of big listed companies pay and even the pay you get there is tiny in comparison to the executives so be sure that you are comfortable with those responsibilities and also we take people through you know who gets sued who, who gets into trouble and usually it's because they've been dishonest didn't turn up to the meetings and didn't ask the right questions and it wasn't minuted and actually the law is not out to get you and we can go through court cases kids company and all that where they've got to we can talk about Carillion. most people don't go to jail because they do the right thing companies fail so it's about stepping up to society and saying if you and i don't step up or we don't get more black individuals to step up or ethnic minorities and communities. It's about doing the right thing to strengthen our organizations in the community, but also in the listed sector. And we know for sure that diverse teams perform better. That's assuming that they're well-managed and well-chaired. Yeah, and, and, that they've, and that they've got cognitive diversity, most importantly. Yes, because it's not about women. There's some research by the IMF where they followed about 3 million companies across uh, Europe or might have been worldwide companies. When you get more women at the top, the performance falls again. It is about diversity of thought. The only thing we can assess is if you, you all look the same and went to the same university, possibly did the same degree because you're recruiting completely your own image, there is a risk to your business. You might not be the same. There's more diversity within gender than there is between the genders. Yeah. Hey everybody, it's uh, Andrew here. Just wanted to very briefly interrupt this podcast episode to tell you a little bit more about our Career Jump Club. So our Career Jump Club was created to help job seekers understand what they want and how to get it, right? So becoming a club member is a great move if you're looking to get the clarity and confidence in order to secure your next role. With the membership you get a number of different things so first thing you get is access to our online platform which has over 30 videos 40 50 different templates workbooks and it takes you through everything from sort of understanding what you want to how to position your cv and linkedin how to interview how to close offers and negotiate better salaries a full end-to-end -end job search course effectively for senior leaders so you get that you get a fortnightly group coaching call um, which is with me and with the other members where we bounce around best practice, share slide decks, share techniques and share the latest data on what's working for people. And you get to most importantly become part of our closed LinkedIn group and our closed community. And in there is where the magic often happens because you get people referring each other into opportunity, supporting each other and just share it. And that's what it's all about. So if you're financially able and you'd like to invest in your job search, head on over to www exec exec careerjump.com or one word forward slash club and you'll find the landing page and come and give it a go we'll see you in there anyway back to the pod so some people will be taking up these uh, board positions as part of a uh, portfolio approach to their career i've seen more and more people starting to do that earlier and earlier whereas we used to it used to be kind of the last chapter most commonly in people's careers we're seeing that you know come in a, a lot earlier what, what do you think's driving that what are you seeing the same first and foremost and what do you think's driving that well the average age if you look at um company boards if you look at the FTSE all share so there's about 600 companies in the FTSE all share more listed on the exchange than 600 the average age is about off the top of my head about 65 uh for men and it's about 55 58 for women so the age profile has got lower, not just because women have been coming onto the board, um, but the, the bottom line is the more you've worked, the more age and wisdom and the things that you've seen, the chances are you'll add more value. But here's the interesting thought is the average person who gets onto a big listed board as an executive registered director as opposed to a non-executive director, because you, I think, really are talking about those non-execs. They've mm -hmm. usually been on a board of some sort of something before the age of 28. Mm. So here I'm talking about hospice board, a charity board. They have been floating at the top of an organization outside their current organization way before they've been senior in their current organization. They're already different. Mm. They've got a sense of governance issues, risk issues, HR issues that might not be anything to do with their day job, 
They're networked outside their box. They're rubbing shoulder with leaders. So if you choose the right board, and you have to choose the right board, it's a bit like taking a mini MBA and masters in business. And until you join a board, you don't know what you know and what you don't know. So that's to me why age shouldn't be a barrier. But the question is, what are we talking about? Clearly, if you get to the listed level, unless you are bringing something completely unique that they cannot get with somebody who's got age and business experience, they will recruit you at the age of 30. Mm. Over age of 50. And that's why you've seen some of the, the age range come down because on the digital side, which is mm. a big thing that boards are looking for at the moment, they can't get it at the age range that they normally recruit. So that has been bringing it down. But there is no reason why you cannot do something really effective uh, being a school governor or on a hospice board, just know what you're doing and how you're going to have value. And boards are very, very boring. So make sure you care about the organisation because if you do, you'll do the right thing. Mm. Which will lead to you being more successful anyway. So start there. I like that. The alignment with that purpose makes perfect sense. And yeah, I think it's fascinating. And it makes sense. It's the digital piece that's that's attracting some of the younger people that I've seen landing on boards earlier into their career. It's very good. I mean, we, we, do, um, we do a lot of work uh, with about 30 different really big corporates like JP Morgan, PwC, uh, Link Lakers. We've also been doing some work with Mondelez International, which is Kraft Foods, Cadbury's, all that sort of stuff. And we uh, talk about the boardroom. We said, you know, if you're ambitious, what does the board of your company do? How many committees are there reporting into your board? And you might find that some of these big organisations have got 33 subsidiary boards in the UK, for example. Think about all the committees that report into them. Who's on them? What do they do and why? And don't tell me you're ambitious if you don't know. Because, and again, we, we do, I do a lot of talks on the seven reasons. I'm doing one this evening uh, for a Black Empowerment Network, which is why being on a board is good for you your company but also society and you imagine one of them is a differentiation on your cv you imagine you work for um, one of the big accountants so let's take pwc as one of our corporate members you've got two individuals wanting to go up for partnership one's a leader in their community uh, and a trustee of a large known charity in the community and one isn't there's thousands of people going up for partnership. How do you choose between these, all these fantastically ambitious, excellent people? You often choose the one that's uh, sitting on a board because they, they've differentiated themselves. They're likely to bring in different connections, different experience, they're demonstrating a different network. And those are the things why being on a board can be really, really empowering. And I haven't mentioned if you take a career break, oh my gosh, isn't that marvelous? If you to be on a small community board to keep your knowledge gap keep your confidence skills and keep those skills going and and when when we work with corporates we're often talking planting seeds I have no idea when it's going to germinate I don't know who will be listening to this podcast if I've planted a seed that might germinate in five years time ten years time or a seed that they can spread around their community to younger people and getting them engaged into the governance structure of organization then I have to be making a difference and I have to be doing the right thing love that absolutely love that and yeah I, I think I mean decisions are made based on um, the trust that people feel for somebody and by nature if somebody is working on a number of small boards whilst they've been in transition or whatever it might be just how you would feel about how they use their time and and their, their personal brand would would be different I totally get that what about the um, startup ecosystem you obviously had a, a period of time as an angel investor getting involved with some of these projects very interesting space in the UK and beyond I'm sure you'd agree what do you think about you know board compositions in you know, C to Series A, Series B type style organisations that are in fast, fast growth mode. I think if you go, I mean, I'm, I've been involved, I chair the remuneration, uh, sorry, the nominations committee of an organisation called Hanks, which is a startup company in the UK that manufactures condoms. All right. And uh, one of the things that it's two women who started off, one of which is a gynaecologist, a doctor, 
Uh, and then the other one was working for Goldman Sachs in the finance department. And they decided that condoms were currently sold and they look sort of very male in terms of Trojan, black branding, yeah. sort of quite um, macho. So they've got a sort of a feminine version of, of, of the condom and they do lots of different things at the moment. And I happened to meet them. And obviously they've raised money. They've got some of their investors on their board. And actually, they need, when you're on a board, a good board has skills audits, but a guide on the side. So they were trying to chair their own board. Now, they're two relatively young female entrepreneurs. And I said, who's actually making sure it's not a one way conversation with the investors because their time frame for success might be different from your time frame from success you know maybe you should bring in a new chair so we advertise for a chair on women on boards and, and we've supported them in a number of ways but usually when you're on a, a board you have to big organizations tend to be more conformance and governance than they are sort of performance uh, startups are all about performance and actually, there's often a fast cash burn. Being really on top of the cash flow is important. And if you have somebody on your board, you really want to know what they're going to bring. Is it investment connections? Is it money? What is it? And actually, the structure of your board and what you need is going to constantly change. Um, and being comfortable sitting on one of those boards, and I know big companies go into liquidation, I mean, Carillion is an example of that, um, but you need to be comfortable with that risk award and that funding if you sit on a startup board but they can be really interesting uh, they often can't afford to pay non-execs so are you going to get something called sweat equity and and how's that negotiated they're not going to give you a sweat equity unless you're really going to deliver for them like an investor with cash would and some of them I've seen uh, we've advertised a few where you know the payment is in or they either want you to invest and then we say well hold on a second is that the right thing for us to be advertising those board positions it, it, it's a fascinating sector so again I've been involved with an organization called Spectral and Spectral is a gender pay gap reporting company and I sat on their board for a bit I'm now on their advisory board and it's fascinating and I love helping entrepreneurs it's just a super place to be. But again, you need to understand the risk and be able to cope with the risk of that fast changing market. Totally. I think the latest stat I saw was that 80% of seed funded don't make Series B. So the, yeah. uh, the risk is very, very clear. But the need is so clear as well, because quite often you've got some really young, talented founders on one side, VCs on the other. And that marriage counselling piece of yeah. being able to uh, facilitate I think was a really nice expression that you used earlier so no thank you for that it is an exciting space and I'm seeing them again appointing NEDs advisors whatever it might be far earlier as well far earlier into the journey so I, think okay. I mean a good board that's well structured normally you find that one of the non-execs um, can be a, a mentor a sort of little unofficial coach for one of the executives within a company uh, and the dynamics of how that works and I think you're right that happens more in the startup phase but I would look for startups you don't always have to be on the board a lot of them have advisory boards so an advisory board might just be on funding it might be on products it might be on digital and again it's the skill of the entrepreneurs to how they use their advisors because you're not actually a registered director but that can look great on your cv and that's what i'm doing for hanks i just advise them as and when they need it and i'm hugely proud of what they've achieved and you know i remember when they first uh, listed they, they had their condoms in boots so i went and bought the whole shelf <laughs> i thought why am i doing this and i just want to help them and uh, i sort of took a video of me buying these condoms in boots uh, and it was actually in fleet street but there's a long story as to why it was in fleet street and of course you, you don't make a successful business there's um, innocence i don't know whether you remember the innocent smoothies yeah, um, cool. it's, a, it's a great podcast i can't remember who did that i think it was one of the bbc podcasts you can't list your products in one of these big supermarkets whether it's sainsbury's and just buy all the products uh, actually other people have to buy them <laughs> because there is no business if you keep buying your own products back you it's a fast way to lose business but anyway i was i was buying them myself well for... good for you that's that's true <laughs> true support there fiona over and above well done yeah and I, for me I, I think the any d's and advisors i've worked with have been the, the expression gets used a lot i've been a critical friend mm. i think 
and, and I think that's probably why I need to appoint one in the next uh, 12 months as well. So an aside, I've been thinking about that since you've been talking. But it's that critical friend thing of holding you to account as much as anything. Because if you are the founder, you don't really have anybody to hold you to account. Not really. Obviously, customers always do. But having somebody there as a critical friend to hold you to account and picking wisely, picking one which might not be the easiest, but will get the best out of you. Yeah, I mean, you know, I'm just look. If you look at the corporate governance code, what does it say? Constructive challenge and help develop the company strategy. So that's a critical friend. Scrutinize the management's performance and agree goals and monitor the performance. So, you know, is the strategy right? Satisfy the integrity of the financial accounts. You know, are um, and the risk and controls are they robust? Remuneration. How much should we pay you? <laughs> and is that pay fair? And what are the risks there? And succession planning. So you're steering strategy and overseeing governance. But when you go for an interview, that critical friend is really important. If people don't know you, you're going to have to interview better than somebody's known by the board because they want to know that you understand to how to constructively challenge. If you're going to be picking on the executive team, particularly if it's a startup and they're, they're shareholders and they're founders and you're not, the dynamics is of that critical friend's not going to work. There has to be a trust. And it's a bit like meeting management. The higher up you go in large corporates, the more effective you need to use your voice in meetings. So you can't take, I don't know, a proposal in a meeting and pick on every comment. You think, well, where's my voice most wisely used hold that voice back master the pre-meeting and all of those things and those skills that you can get as an executive getting that right as a non-exec is crucially important so when you're being interviewed how you are presenting yourself in the interview how pithy and focused your answers are is telling us something about how you might behave if you're a non-exec and because we don't know you you're going to have to perfect that which is why what my organization does is so crucial yes we advertise board positions for free twenty thousand of them 50 new ones every week so anybody listening to this podcast you can advertise and we have the most fantastic members and there's nothing gender specific about any of our board positions so we've got some fantastic male members you know we've got the best roles and they also know that we'll hold their hand at the point of interview and that's reminding them and I say to them you know I've seen the brief what's your board value add and they start chatting to me and I said no can you be very digital with an expertise in Brazil yeah which, if it's one of their main markets coming in be focused and on it and be very very direct because that's what they want and it's a relationship and it's perfecting that confidently in interview. And it's very confident and difficult, you alluded to earlier, to be good at interviewing in a space you've never been at before, which is why clearly being on a small local community charity board is not the same as being on a listed board. But you will have learned so much about you and how you have developed your board style that when you are being interviewed, possibly for a listed late, and it's not all about listed or a big public appointment, you know, taxpayers' money being used properly, um, you're going to interview better because of the experience you've had on that small board. And not only is that true moving into the non-executive space, that's true up going up in your executive career as well. So more companies are encouraging their employees to get involved in society, give back to the community, and it will make them better executives. And anybody who doesn't get that is just about to lose their top talent because stop treating people like children, hiding the toys under the table and not allowing your employees to develop themselves. Yeah, well, some of them have got it prohibited in contract, so that needs to... Yeah, and, and we had uh, a couple of our investment banks, they've said, and we've, we've several of them, Morgan Stanley's a corporate member, Credit Suisse, JP Morgan, but I remember one of those, I won't say which one, said, no, 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 uh, none of our employees can go on boards, not at all. Accountants will say the same thing, lawyers will say the same thing, we audit everything, right? and if we don't, we want to. Um, the reality is you just need to get their board out and go onto the Charities Commission and find out what boards they're on, because there are loads of them. Because when they're saying no, they're imagining you're talking listed. You're not talking listed. You're talking about the local hospital. Yeah, no conflict so at all. It's no conflict at all. And why is it OK for those who have connections to people in power to get that signed off, but not for the rest of the company? Again, mm. that's the old boys network sort of working more effectively for those in the gang than not in the gang. And when that's 
pointed out to people, they realise that actually they're shooting themselves in the foot. And nearly all of those companies that said that five or six years ago have changed. And that's why they're corporate members, because they want to encourage their staff to do it because they realise it's good for them, good for society, good for the company, good for the individual. But yeah, it's a fascinating conversation. And it's one of my favourites because I've always done my homework before I get into that conversation. And uh, they are shocked. You floor them completely. Sorry, is it okay for you? Because I see that you've been on six different boards. Why is it okay for you? And they just look at it and go, uh, you can't control your employees anymore. You shouldn't try to. You shouldn't try to, yeah. You shouldn't try to, as simple as that. Loads of really good points in there. And I love this idea of democratising those board opportunities. I think that's fantastic. And the bit that you said as well around self-concept going into interview, I think one of the big barriers is the same humility that makes people good leaders and good colleagues actually gets in the way of them selling themselves. And so that extra bit of time getting used to confidently understanding your own value proposition, whether that is connections in Brazil or whatever it might be, I, I think super, super advice. A couple of quick fire ones then if we can, Fiona, just uh, before we wrap. Any books that have really helped shape your thinking that you'd recommend to listeners? I'm not, I do read a lot of books, but I actually, I'm a fan of audio books. So one of my favorite books recently was Brotopia. Mm -hmm. Now we talked about angel investing and um, I didn't understand how difficult it was for minorities to get on in the city because I hadn't had that problem. Um, but related to angel investment, angel uh, Brotopia is all about capital and how capital's moving around and how, you know, there's something in there called the PayPal mafia. You know, the first people who made lots of money in PayPal have seeded all these other businesses and how it's controlled by quite a few and that relationships of getting capital. So Brotopia for me was one of the most surprising books because I thought I'd seen it all with regard to the issues that minority had. Brotopia really shocked me. Really, no. really shocked. Culture matters and capital. So that's one book. My favourite book of all time is Love in the Time of Cholera, but that's uh, a romance, which uh, Gabrielle Garcia Marquez, fantastic. Love it. What does a good board CV look like? A good board CV is not an executive CV and it's about your value proposition. So I ought to be able to flick my eye on your CV. I'm not going to be bothered to read you somewhere and I should see three words. That's all that explain your board value add. And if I can't see that really, really quickly and I'm not interested in your executive day job, I want to understand your board value add. So if you've had any committee experience, board experience, proxy board experience, reporting to boards I want to see that under your summary in the front page telling me you understand the role of the board so we have a CV course in the cloud for our members and it's idiot's guide as to how to write a board position and you have to have a good one and even if your friend helps you get that interview remember everyone else doesn't know you and they will have read your CV and they'll already have a view of you so you better make sure it's a good one and we have one top tip get your executive CV shred it don't look at it and start with a blank piece of paper because you will copy it. Yeah. And it's, it's a big, deep dive and a mine. And it could be something you did 20, 30 years ago that should be at the top of your CV. 100%. Love that. That's a really, really good tip. And finally, what are your predictions for the second half of 2021? Lots of change. What are you... Uh, Gosh, what are my predictions? That's a different one. I mean, certainly in the board space, I think um, ESG will mm. be the big thing. Companies are really, if they didn't understand purpose before, if you're going to embrace the environment and that change that we need to have for our younger generation who've been punished many, many times over uh, with what's going on in society at the moment because of, you know, the wealth that the, the people who are in the property, the, the aging population, all that sort of stuff, we need to get ESG right and purpose. Oh, I, th I think that will be the big change that comes through. Um, for me, uh, that's absolutely crucial. So I think you're going to see annual reports. I think you're going to even see your local school. Everyone's going to be talking about the environment and those that don't will be punished in terms of funding. So that would be my big message. You know, get your environmental social governance and purpose right for your companies because without that it's that balance between short-term profits against long-term and the ESG that's quite a different dynamic and discussion so that would be my thing to get on top of and there are very few ESG environmental experts in the boardroom. 
No, what a great bit of advice that is. And companies need to get on top of that from a talent attraction perspective as well. We've got a investment in an early careers academy and a lot of young people pick their next employer based on how they view they are impacting, what kind of uh, corporate, good corporate citizen they are, these sort of factors. So as well as being the right thing to do, there's a talent element to it. There's an investment element to it. There's talk of share valuations, obviously having some link towards some of these factors as well. So I just think that's tremendous advice. Brilliant. You've been very, very uh, generous with all your input. Thank you so much for doing that. Anybody who's listening, what's the best way for them to follow up with your organisation, Fiona? I would just log on to womenonboards.net. We've got a UK operation, Australia operation. So if you're in the uh, Europe, click on the UK operation and register as a free member. You know, hover for as long as you like. You'll get a sense of what we do. We have lots of different events. Uh, we don't run events for events sake. It's all related to the boardroom and introducing you to people on boards. And then consider investing in yourself to get access to our vacancy board because we have to charge uh, for all the staff and the costs that we have and consider coming on to a get on board workshop then let's accelerate your understanding of your value proposition to get you into the boardroom faster absolutely magnificent make sure you do that folks and thank you very much again fiona for coming on it's been great to meet you you're welcome lovely to meet you too andrew thank you you. you've been listening to the career jump podcast with andrew mccaskill for more resources and information just head over to the career jump website at www.execcareerjump.com to supercharge your job search and start making moves let's get to work